Seven out of ten of the world's hungry people are farmers. Many children growing up in agricultural communities suffer an almost annual hunger season. A hunger season is the part of the year when most of the previous harvest has already been exhausted, while there are still a few months before the next harvest can be expected. Families survive on a dwindling supply. It's not uncommon for a child to get only one meal to eat. Children's development and education get stuck, and we see ripple effects throughout the society and the economy. Yet, smallholder farmers are among those that work the hardest. Women carry more than their share. According to the UNDP, women, women smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa produce 80 to 90 percent of the food. As the world's population continues to grow, the African agricultural potential will become increasingly critical for both global and regional food security. These farmers are the solution, not the problem. As a management consultant, I have advised clients on how to increase profit and drive growth for most of the last two decades. Three years ago, I joined the Norwegian Church Aid Project to find scalable ways of helping people climb out of poverty. You might think that advising corporate clients is a far stretch from working with smallholder farmers in Eastern Africa, but essentially, the job is the same. I work with a team to understand the current situation, to find attractive opportunities for change, and to make that change happen. True to my profession, I started by analyzing the situation. I found that these, these farmers' hard work and the land that they use rarely return more than $2 a day. Their harvest is typically like a fifth of what is achievable with slight changes in agricultural practices. The, the use of fertilizer and improved seeds. In low-income countries, farmers are seven out of ten people. At the same time, job creation outside agriculture hardly ever grows faster than one percent per year. This tells me three things. Firstly, job creation outside agriculture cannot be the solution. It takes way too long. Secondly, a manifold increase in agricultural produce is a major must. And thirdly, these farmers must be at the core of any strategy to end hunger. Let me tell you about maize, one of the most popular livelihoods for, for poor smallholders. If you prefer the American term, it's corn. Um, a $100 investment in improved seeds and, and fertilizer typically returns a five-fold improvement in your harvest. But if you're living on $2 a day, a $100 investment is not affordable. Even if you do have $100 available for investment, putting all your eggs in one basket seems risky. For the few who do invest and actually do get the five-fold or even more uh, return uh, on their harvest, their daily average income still only increase with 50 to 75 cents hardly lifting them out of poverty. And if you want to scale that income, you need a lot of land. 
So the main problem is not financing the investment. If financing the investment was the main problem, then microfinance would be the solution. The main issue is the abysmal low return on hard work and land. Their business model must change so that there can be cash on the table after the children have been fed and their school fees have been paid. I think we have found such an attractive alternative model. Let me tell you about Mama Elisa. Mama Elisa is a widow with four children and five grandchildren. She's one of our customers in the village outside the Mbeya in southern Tanzania. I first met her about 15 months ago. A few months before that, her income uh, was less than $2 a day. Let each of the silhouettes behind me represent one billion people. Together, they represent the world. Mama Lisa belonged to the bottom billion of the world's population. But Mama Lisa has escaped poverty. In six months, Mama Lisa grew her own income from less than $2 a day towards $12 a day. Before we go into details about how she achieved that, let's take a moment to reflect on the significance of her journey. By passing the $10 a day level, Mama Lisa's income journeyed from the bottom billion towards that of the upper half of the world's population. Imagine if she's just a front runner. I believe that she and many of her other customers are front runners with millions of potential followers. Let me explain why. This is all based on assets that she already ha had most of it. She had access to some land, a few hundred square meters in her case. She had access to some water, and there was an abundance of sunshine. Add to this her own hard work, which is significant. To make the leap out of poverty, she also needed improved seeds, fertilizer, and uh, probably some irrigation. But all of this had to be affordable. And it had to present her with an attractive profit at a minimal risk. Affordable to her meant investments in less than $10 increments. An attractive profit at a, an attractive profit at a minimal risk meant a proven business model that could provide a steady cash flow throughout the year rather than an annual harvest that hit the market as it reached its annual low. The first concept we came up with that met these criteria was the veggie bed. I brought the small sample of the equipment that we're using, just to showcase its simplicity. We're using a 20 liter tank, bigger than this one. And we're using two eight meter long drip lines. And then we put the small clothing on the top, just to avoid that dirt comes with the water and clogs the system. Simplicity 
is beautiful. She also needed to have some fertilizer. Fertilizer comes in 50 kilo bags, while all she needs for the first three seasons is 1.5 kilo. She needed, as a drip line, comes in big rolls. So what we did was that we made a kit, just what she needed to make an eight square meter or about 90 square feet uh, veggie bed. This made it affordable for Mama Lisa. And Mama Lisa responded by uh, investing in four veggie beds. She paid the $28 herself from her savings, what she had for a rainy day. And in three months, this returned her just north of 500 US dollars. Finally, her hard work had started to pay off. In six months, or, uh, she, uh, step by step, she, she reinvested $60 into eight more veggie beds. And in six months, she had a $12 a day income. Farmers around see and believe. And uh, that allows our, our sales force, consisting of a few agronomists, salespeople, and um, some local champions to sell more than 10,000 veggie beds in the short period of a pilot project through a few hundred villages in Tanzania. Let me add a short side note. The positive climate effect of ju using just a tiny fraction of the land compared to staple crops like maize, yet having a bigger profit, could deserve a separate talk. Some of you have probably started thinking about what about markets. So far, the local markets have absorbed all the supply. But down the road, I'm quite confident that we will have to involve uh, off-takers, such as consumer goods companies and other, other firms. There will be many obstacles working with uh, uh, engaging smallholder farmers as micro-investors. I'm confident that what I've seen so far is proof of concept pointing towards a new and better approach where these farmers are recognized for their resourcefulness and key role. In summary, technology and knowledge can be bundled to kits or concepts that can totally transform the local profit level, fixing it. These kits can be sold as affordable, scalable micro-investments with quick payback. And since farmers are such a huge share of the, of the population in low-income countries, this is a quite generic strategy that can be used across most of the uh, sub-Saharan Africa and similar areas. Through this micro-investment approach, many can follow Mama Elisa's path from living on less than $2 a day, passing the $10 a day income level towards joining the upper half of the world's population. Thank you.